my mother's always been a bit disappointed that I'm now working on well-being. What does it mean? And does it really make any difference? I think it can, and I want to explain why I think so in the next few minutes. The danger is that well-being can seem to mean all things to all people. It's a very broad term, and it's used in a load of different ways. If you look at them, what you find is that the primary use is actually in marketing. It's used as a way of stressing the attractiveness of a particular product, trying to sell you something, trying to get you to take something on. When we're thinking academically then, we need to think about well-being as a field of study or practice or meaning, not a single approach. So whereas some people respond to that complexity by saying, let's standardise, let's authorise a particular approach, I'd see it differently. What I'm going to talk about now are the main approaches to well-being in international development. And the first of these is the capability approach of Amartya Sen. What Sen did was to shift the attention away from commodities or utility to saying what really matters is what people can do or be. Often in development we're looking at people in quite a passive way. We're seeing them as objects or as targets of development programmes. But thinking about what people can do and be puts them in the centre, makes them subjects or active um, people. And in that way, it's very valuable because in the end, development is about what people are able to do. So the second approach that I want to talk about is subjective well-being. And this is probably the approach that we're all most familiar with from market research surveys. Sometimes it's just a single question. How happy are you with your life? Or how satisfied? are you with your life? And in a way that's the great attraction, that it's quite simple, but of course there's all sorts of problems with that too. Does it really make sense to score your life on a 1 to 5 or 1 to 10 scale? What you'll find in practice is that in development anyway, that subjective approach, that is how people are thinking and feeling about their lives, is linked to objective indicators, the kind of thing we're more used to. So quality of housing or education or income, for example. What you find with subjective well-being is there are some points on which virtually everyone agrees. For example, commuting is bad for you and unemployment is bad for you. It lowers your subjective well-being. What, for example, if the subjective well-being measures told us that unemployment was good for us? How much weight would we put on subjective well-being then? So what are the downsides of subjective well-being? The first is that it can be quite sensitive to local issues. That is the design of questionnaire. For example, people have found that if you ask questions about politics, just before you ask questions about how satisfied people are with their life, yes, you guessed it, the scores go down. Subjective well-being is really a black box. When people say they're satisfied with their lives, we don't know what they're saying. We don't know what they're thinking of. We don't know really anything about it other than that giving us a score. So I think there's a bit of a credibility question here. Credibility in terms of, can you really measure your life in such a simple way? The third approach to, um, to well-being in international development is psychological well-being. In international development, this approach is used particularly in conflict or post-conflict situations. So, for example, it may be associated with diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. Its downside is the opposite to subjective well-being. Instead of being just a black box, some people say it has too much content. And particularly because the main approaches are developed in North America, so may have a kind of cultural context, which is very different from the approaches in which they're being applied. Another criticism of psychological well-being is that it can be what Ahmed talks about. She talks about hierarchies of happiness reflecting social hierarchies. So what that means is, rather than subjective well-being just saying whatever makes you happy, that's fine, we don't need to know what it is, Psychological well-being says, no, there's actually some better ways to be. The next approach that I want to talk to you about is relational well-being. This is much less well known than the others. And I'd say it's really an emergent approach. So what we see is lots of people talking about relational well-being coming from all different parts of the world. 
often coming from a more qualitative background, whereas the other approaches, um, subjective well-being and psychological well-being, it tends to be people who are coming from a more quantitative approach. Relational well-being, more broadly, also relates to the, the attempt to think through the relations between human well-being and the natural world and the extent to which our own well-being as people is actually very dependent and interrelated both with one another and with the natural world. And obviously concerns about climate change and so on come into that. It also is more flexible. So it has an idea of well-being as something that happens over time rather than as a, a set state that you own as an individual. So it draws attention to process, it draws attention to relationship, it draws attention to the relationships between people and place and time. There are also the usual questions that arise about participatory approaches. So questions about communities. Can you really have one approach? Does everybody in a community identify well-being in the same way? What about differences by gender? And particularly in relation to well-being, actually, differences by life cycle. So people at different stages of the life cycle will have diff very different kinds of priorities and understandings of what's important to them. Children, middle-aged people, elderly people. You can already see the sorts of differences which there are. Alongside that, of course, there's the question of comparability across context. So where you gain in terms of being able to understand a local context well, you may lose in terms of being able to compare levels of well-being across context. For those people who can, are very concerned about measurement, this approach presents some more challenges than some of the other ones do. My own view is that we need to think about not so much assessment of people, but rather reflection with people. And for that, I think relational well-being is a really useful approach to take. In our recent research in Chiawa, Zambia, for example, we were able to see that, yes, there has been development in terms of economic growth through large dams, tourism and intensive plantation agriculture. But in general, it has undermined rather than enhanced the well-being of the local population. You can see this both in objective economic terms and in subjective psychosocial terms especially through the widespread sense of insecurity, which is associated with threats to local land rights. In drawing attention to this, it was really helpful to have well-being as an alternative register to development, so that we could say, yes, local people want development, but it needs to be development that engages with them and that puts their well-being at the centre. To sum up, what's the take-home message? I think it is important to think about well-being in the context of international development, but we do need to be careful how we do this. In particular, we need to recognise that the methods people use make a great deal of difference to the accounts of well-being that they produce. Paradoxically, although the recent wave of interest in well-being has emphasised subjective dimensions, that is what people think and feel, it has also been dominated by quantitative, highly statistical approaches which are not very accessible for many people. My view, and it is one that is shared by a growing number of people from a more qualitative background, is that the quantitative measures can only tell a very small part of the story. They must be complemented by talking with and listening to people so that they can express what is important to them in their own words. How people are doing in material terms continues to make a tremendous difference to the terms on which they relate with others and how they think and feel about their lives. Well-being is experienced holistically with material, relational and subjective vitally intertwined. It is also experienced intersubjectively, in space and over time, in and through relationships with others. Will this answer satisfy my mother? Well, she's a hard critic, but hopefully it will go at least some way to doing so.